Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. No body, no crime is a common phrase in the justice system, also known as bodiless murder or nobody homicide. But no matter what you call it, it means the same thing. In years past, if you can't find the victim's body, then you can't prove the victim was murdered. And when you think about it, that wasn't a terrible idea. In fact, it makes a lot of sense. Throughout history, the punishment for murder has always been severe. Lifelong imprisonment, death. These are experiences that you don't come back from, literally. It was difficult to justify sentencing someone to such extreme consequences without the victim's body. After all, what if the victim wasn't really dead? And it's happened before. In the 18th century, a young woman disappeared. Her uncle was accused of murdering her. A judge demanded that the uncle present his niece to the court. If she was alive, it would prove he didn't kill her. Easy, right? Except the uncle couldn't find his niece. So he brought a different young woman to the courtroom and lied. This is my niece, the uncle said. But the judge saw through the uncle's lies. He realized that this young woman was an imposter. And more than that, the judge assumed that the uncle's lie was an admission of guilt. That's why he brought a fake niece to the court, to hide his misdeeds. The uncle was tried, sentenced, and executed. Years later, when the murdered niece turned old enough to claim her uncle's fortune, she returned to claim her inheritance in person. She was alive and well, and her uncle, who was not a murderer, was dead. As a result of situations like these, many states developed nobody, no crime laws. Courts wanted to avoid unfairly convicting people of murder. And if a few murderers got away in the process, well, it couldn't be helped. Today, our modern legal system handles nobody cases differently. Courts need corpus delecti to convict a murderer of a crime. While corpus delecti is Latin for body of the crime, it doesn't mean that a murder case must have a body. It means there must be significant evidence that a crime occurred before someone can be convicted. That evidence could be a victim's body, or it could be a combination of witness accounts or forensic evidence and other circumstantial evidence. Still, it's incredibly difficult to convict a person of murder without the victim's body. Tad DeBias is a federal homicide prosecutor and author of the book, Nobody Homicide Cases. And according to him, there have been an estimated 500 trials for nobody cases in the United States. Of those 500 trials, approximately 40 cases have been solved in 15 states. That's 8% meaning that 92% of the time that the victim's body isn't found, someone might be getting away with murder. Welcome to episode 177, The Disappearance and Murder of Teresa Parker. Teresa Ann Fielding was born on September 9th of 1965 to her mother Claire and father William in San Diego, California. Teresa spent her youngest years on the West Coast, but by the time she was a teenager, her family had moved to their forever home, Lafayette, Georgia. Located in Northwest Georgia, Lafayette is the seat of Walker County. Lafayette is considered a bedroom community for the more heavily populated Chattanooga, Tennessee, meaning people go to Chattanooga to work and grab dinner and attend big events. But at the end of the day, they drive 30 miles south back to their bedrooms in Lafayette. With just under 7,000 residents, Lafayette is a small, sleepy town. It has a rich Civil War history and an annual honeybee festival in the summertime. Lafayette is a far cry from the hustle and bustle of Teresa's previous home in San Diego. But this change of scenery might have been an intentional decision by Teresa's parents. Since her father was from Georgia, he would have known the Lafayette area. Maybe he thought it was a better place for his children to grow up than in San Diego. 
After all, Lafayette City website says it's a great place to raise a family. And Teresa had a great family. She had two sisters and two brothers. Out of five kids, Teresa was the middle child, and it showed. According to Reader's Digest, middle children are often characterized as peacemakers. By default, middle children are always the ones to negotiate truces between their arguing siblings. This is a broad generalization, of course, but for Teresa, it rang true. She was such a peacemaker that her family affectionately nicknamed her Mother Teresa. Teresa's sister Christina said her kindness, calmness, and empathy held their family together like glue. Teresa loved everyone, and everyone loved Teresa. She was the type of person who was happy to help whoever, whenever, no questions asked. And she was always there for her family. Teresa was a fantastic aunt to her many nieces and nephews. Her brother-in-law said, you'd instantly fall in love with her. She was just that way. She just made you feel comfortable. In 1984, Teresa graduated from Lafayette High School. She married her first husband, but it didn't work out. They divorced. Then sometime in the early 90s, she became a dispatcher for the city of Lafayette Police Department. She was an instant star. Her colleagues liked her. The Lafayette police officers liked her. One police officer in particular really liked her, and that officer was Sam Parker. Samuel Logan Parker was born in 1956. His father raised him in Lafayette, alongside his older sister Carolyn and his younger brother Kenneth. From a young age, Sam was very close to his father. So close that friends and family called Sam Daddy's Little Buddy for many years. Sam and his little brother Kenneth were also two peas in a pod. Kenneth described his and Sam's childhood as idyllic, that they were like the Norman Rockwell version of two brothers growing up next to a river. But Sam's older sister, Carolyn, remembered their childhood differently. She recalled Sam as having quite the temper. Like Teresa, Sam was the middle child. But unlike Teresa, Sam was not known for ending conflicts. He was known for starting them. Still, Sam was a likable young man. He had a quick wit and a smart mouth. When he wasn't playing pranks on his friends, he was exploring the outdoors around Lafayette. He would hunt in the dense woods or fish in the countless ponds. After he turned 18, Sam joined the military. Then in the early 80s, he became a Lafayette police officer. Sam's brother, Kenneth, looked up to Sam as a role model. He even followed a similar career path as Sam. Kenneth told 48 Hours he went into the Marine Corps I went into the Marine Corps. He went in the police department, law enforcement. I went into law enforcement. And it makes sense that Sam encouraged his little brother to go into law enforcement. Sam loved being a police officer. His friends joked that he was on duty 24-7. To Sam, being an officer of the law was the dream. And he would never jeopardize his dream. Sam did everything by the book. His uniform was spotless. His patrol car was meticulously clean. And beyond that, Sam was a pretty good police officer. He once saved a child from a burning building. After that, Sam was named the local police officer of the year. The Lafayette Police Department might have been Sam's favorite place on earth. So, when the new 911 dispatcher, beautiful 20-something Teresa Parker, walked in, it must have felt like fate. Right away, Sam asked Teresa out, and the two began dating. Over time, their relationship became more and more serious. Friends and family thought Sam and Teresa made a handsome couple. Sam was 6'1 with blue eyes and brown hair, and Teresa was a petite brunette with brown eyes. They looked sharp together. Teresa's younger sister, Christina, told 48 Hours that she liked Sam, mostly. He was a gentleman and he had a good sense of humor. But Christina and others often felt Sam took his jokes way too far. He didn't know when to stop. But hey, Teresa was head over heels for the guy. Even though he had two failed marriages under his belt, 
But Christina trusted her sister's judgment. In fact, Christina was pretty sure Sam and Teresa would stay together forever. And that's exactly what Sam and Teresa thought too. So on September 11th, 1993, 28-year-old Teresa married 37-year-old Sam. Near this time, Sam had made rank of sergeant for the Lafayette PD, and Teresa was a supervisor at the Walker County 911 Center. For a while, Sam and Teresa were incredibly happy with their marriage. But after a few years, the honeymoon period passed, and that's when their relationship began to unravel. Sam and Teresa were constantly at odds, and these weren't small, I chose the restaurant last time arguments. These were big blowout fights, screaming, tears, the whole nine yards. But somehow, they would always make up. Sam's brother Kenneth described their relationship as a seesaw, but that evidently, they liked it that way. Sam and Teresa were well aware that their relationship was struggling, but to Sam, the two weren't hostile towards each other. They just weren't in love anymore. Sam told 48 Hours, the marriage was playing itself out, but it wasn't in a bad way. Sam and Teresa filed for divorce in August of 2006 after nearly 13 years of marriage. But in the fall and winter of 2006, Sam and Teresa reconciled. They resolved to stick things out, for better or for worse. But only a few months later, in March of 2007, Teresa decided she was done. She went on a quick vacation to Mexico without Sam. She signed a new lease in a different city, and she filed for divorce. Soon after, Teresa and Sam were officially separated. Sam was going to get the house. So Teresa was in the process of moving out. She had taken a few days off from her job at the Walker County 911 Center to get her new place in order. So on Wednesday, March 21st, 2007, Teresa didn't go into work. She was moving her stuff from her old house with Sam to her new apartment. After a long day of trucking boxes back and forth, Teresa took a break that evening. She went to her younger sister Christina's house. Teresa was so excited to show Christina her apartment. It was a few miles north of Lafayette and Fort Oglethorpe and it was much closer to Christina's house. This was handy. Teresa would be able to see her sister and her nieces and nephews much more often. She loved being present in their lives. But as Christina and Teresa said goodbye that night, Christina felt weird. She couldn't put her finger on it exactly, but something felt wrong. She told 48 Hours, when I hugged her that night, it was just the strangest thing. It was almost just like this feeling of, I was never going to see her again. I just got the emptiest feeling. Then, Teresa hopped in her SUV and drove to Sam's house. She was going to sleep there before continuing to move the rest of her stuff out the next day. At around 10.30 p.m., Teresa's good friend and co-worker, Rhonda Knox, gave her a call. Teresa told Rhonda she was headed to Sam's house, but she was taking her sweet time getting there. Teresa wanted to wait long enough that Sam would be asleep. She was sick of fighting. It would have made things a lot easier if her estranged husband was out cold when she walked in. Rhonda wasn't shocked to hear that Teresa was avoiding Sam. Teresa had confided in Rhonda about Sam's hot temper before. Rhonda and Teresa spoke for a while, and then the two hung up. Rhonda went to bed, and she assumed that Teresa did the same. The next day, at 6 a.m., Rhonda got a call from Teresa. But when she picked up the phone, Teresa didn't say anything. The call abruptly ended. This freaked Rhonda out. Was she okay? Was that even her on the other end of the line? Did someone have Teresa's phone? Who? Why? Rhonda panicked. She called Teresa back. Her phone rang a few times before going straight to voicemail. Rhonda called her cell number her landline number, and any other number she could think of over and over again, but Teresa never responded. Concerned that Teresa was hurt or in danger, Rhonda called a friend of hers, a local police officer named Shane Green. Rhonda told Shane the situation and asked him to check on Teresa. So, 
Shane grabbed a few other officers and went to the house. And what they found was odd. At 6.30 a.m., only 30 minutes after that weird phone call from Teresa, Shane and his officers knocked on Sam's door. There was no response. The police officers went around to the house's detached garage and used flashlights to peek inside the windows. Teresa's vehicle, a Toyota 4Runner, should have been in the garage. After all, Teresa was going to spend the night at Sam's house, and she always parked in the garage. But the 4Runner was nowhere to be found, and Shane and his officers did see Sam's patrol car in the garage, and his pickup truck was parked outside the house. Then, mysteriously, that afternoon, Teresa's forerunner reappeared in Sam's garage, and no one could explain how. No one had heard from or seen Teresa since Wednesday night. Not her friend Rhonda, not her sister Christina. Even Sam called Teresa's phone a few times as he tried to figure out where she was. At this point, Teresa's sister Christina wasn't on high alert. After all, Teresa was an adult. She could take care of herself. Plus, Teresa was busy with the move. She told Christina on Wednesday that she was going to deep clean the new apartment on Thursday. So it would make sense that Teresa was focused on scrubbing floors and not looking at her phone. Thursday passed without a word from Teresa. But when Friday, March 23rd came around, with still no sign of Teresa, Christina knew her sister was in danger. She had called Teresa that morning, hoping for a quick chat with her before work, but she didn't pick up. Christina went to work, thinking Teresa would return her call during the day. Teresa always called back as soon as she was able. But Friday passed, and Teresa didn't call. Now Christina was thinking the worst. She told 48 Hours, there were no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I knew something so horrible happened, and I was just scared to death. So on Saturday, March 24, 2007, Teresa's family filed a missing persons report with the Walker County Sheriff's Department. From its inception, Teresa's case was considered a high-priority investigation. Local authorities called the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. The Lafayette Police Department put Sam on leave. Sheriff Steve Wilson told 48 Hours that he could tell that Teresa's case was going to be bigger than Walker County when it was all said and done. But why did Teresa's case grab so much attention from three different law enforcement departments? Lafayette, Walker County, and the state of Georgia were all working on her case in some capacity. Usually, the family of missing adults have to beg and plead for police departments to take the disappearance seriously. They're told, hey, they're an adult. They have money and a car. They're around somewhere. So how did authorities already know that Teresa, a 41-year-old woman, was actually in danger? Well, let's consider the context. Teresa was a supervisor at the Walker County 911 Center. GBI Special Agent Mark Vesey described the situation saying, she's one of our own. She's a 911 dispatcher. She's that person on the other end of the radio. When you're in need, she's there. And then there's Sam Parker, Teresa's husband of 13 years. He was a Lafayette police sergeant. Teresa would have known the local cops, not only from her job at the 911 call center, but also through Sam. This wasn't a random woman going missing in a big city. This was Teresa Parker from the small town of Lafayette with less than 7,000 residents. People knew her, not just the police. And while all of these are sensible reasons as to why the Lafayette PD, the Walker County Sheriff's Department, and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation were interested in Teresa's case, they weren't the main reason. No, the main reason was according to 911 logs, The police were called to Sam and Teresa's location to resolve domestic disputes on two separate occasions. On May 4, 2002, Sam was drunk and angry. According to Teresa's family, that happened a lot. Teresa's sister Christina told 48 Hours that Sam was a violent, mean drunk. He would keep a water bottle in the refrigerator during family dinners or whatever, and he would sneak over there and drink out of this bottle. 
It was straight vodka. I'd seen him in action, you know. So scary. Christina said if Sam was drunk, he could flip from cordial to cruel in the blink of an eye. And this night was no different. When the police arrived at Sam and Teresa's home, they saw a drunk Sam yell and curse at Teresa, who was sobbing. Sam told the officers that Teresa was cheating on him. Sam had thrown Teresa's clothing and other items in the yard, and there was a noticeable red mark on Teresa's face, as if Sam had hit her recently. But Teresa reassured the police that she had just scratched herself, and she refused to press charges. Next, on April 27th of 2003, Sam and Teresa were on vacation in Panama City, Florida. They were at a restaurant when Sam began drinking. Soon after, Sam became angry. While still in the restaurant, Sam threatened Teresa. He told her he would handcuff himself to her, kill himself, and force her to drag his dead body around forever. Sam also threatened to kill her. Teresa was, of course, upset. She left the restaurant. Sam followed and they got in their vehicle. As he pulled out of the parking lot, he pulled out his gun and fired it multiple times out the car window. Immediately, bystanders called the police. When the officers showed up, they could see that Teresa was crying and visibly shaken. But Sam didn't care. He continued to demean Teresa and the officer's presence. He also denied firing a gun. He told the officers he didn't even have a weapon on him. But when the police searched Sam and his vehicle, they found not only one gun, but two. And one of the guns had obviously been recently fired. The police officers were concerned for Teresa, but also for Sam. His suggestion that he would complete suicide was troubling. As a result of this statement, Sam was involuntarily admitted to a Florida mental health facility for a 72-hour observation and psychological evaluation. As the officers drove Sam to the facility, he chatted with them. He bragged to them that, because he was a cop, he could hide a body where no one would find it. And this wasn't the first time that Sam had made that joke. In fact, it wasn't the second time, or the third. Sam told a lot of people that he could successfully hide a body. Usually, he said it in reference to Teresa's body. And you know what? I get the joke. I really do. Think about my job. I'm a true crime podcast host. Do you know how many times my husband has joked that if I killed him, they would never find the body? But Sam's joke was different. Constant. He told nearly everyone in his life how easy it would be to get rid of a body especially in the thick woods of Lafayette, Georgia, Sam's hometown, where he knew those forests like the back of his hand. Sam was certain he could just toss a body in one of Lafayette's many ponds. No one would find it. And eventually, the turtles would eat the corpse. And sometimes when Sam joked that he could kill someone and hide their body, it didn't feel like a joke. It felt downright serious. Before Teresa, Sam and his second wife, Keela Beard, were married for four years. And Keela's account is similar to Teresa's family's account. Sam was known to drink too much and too often. And once Sam was drunk, Sam was angry. Once, Sam was drunk at home with Keela there. It wasn't long before he threw a glass of water in a rage. Glass shattered all over the floor. Then Sam grabbed Keela by the hair and dragged her through the broken glass. He handcuffed Keela, who was bleeding, to the bedpost. Sam only set Keela free when he had to go to work. After this, Keela ended her relationship with Sam for good. But a few months later, Sam broke into Keela's home. He attacked her, accused her of trying to sleep with other men, and strangled her. Then, Sam held his service gun to her head and threatened to blow her brains out. Following this incident, Sam made Keela swear to secrecy. If she didn't keep quiet, Sam would kill her. Keela told 48 Hours, he said, you can believe me that I know how to do it without getting caught, and they will never find your body. Teresa's former sister-in-law, Tabitha, also said that Sam once threatened to kill her, her husband, and her children. 
he made it explicitly clear that he could hide their bodies where no one would find them. And Teresa's mother, Claire, had a similar experience with Sam. Sam threatened Claire and her boyfriend, saying that if they ever came onto his property, he would kill them and hide their bodies where, say it with me, no one would find them. All of this is to say three Georgia law enforcement agencies weren't pursuing Teresa's missing person case out of the kindness of their hearts or because she was one of their own, at least not entirely. They wanted to find Teresa because they already suspected who was responsible for harming her. 52-year-old Sam Parker. And since Sam was one of their own as a current Lafayette police sergeant, the shit was about to hit the fan. In late March of 2007, Lafayette residents were distraught over Teresa's disappearance. This was a quiet town, a great place to raise a family. Your kids could play outside well after the sun had set. You waved at a four-way stop. People didn't go missing. Respected cops weren't accused of foul play. Those things just didn't happen here. And Teresa's family were out of their minds wondering where Teresa, their sister, daughter, and aunt was. Teresa's sister, Christina, told 48 Hours, Every morning when I open my eyes, I think about her. You know, at night when I lay my head down to go to sleep, I think about her. Teresa, where could you be? Sam was also upset about his almost ex-wife's disappearance, but for different reasons. Sam told his brother, Kenneth, that Teresa probably ran off. According to Sam, this was all an elaborate ploy so that Teresa could avoid a divorce. That was a weird rationale for many reasons, but also since it was Teresa who had requested the divorce. If anyone was going to avoid it, it wasn't her. It would be Sam. Hundreds of Lafayette residents volunteered to help search for Teresa. The authorities brought in professional scuba divers to scour bodies of water. When a pond's underwater foliage was so thick that the divers couldn't see anything, they drained the pond. And they searched everywhere. The local landfill, underwater caves, swimming holes. They used robotic cameras to get to hard-to-reach places. They reviewed hours of surveillance tape recorded by nearby businesses. They put up missing persons posters, billboards, and started a phone line for tips. This was truly no stone left unturned police work. In total, law enforcement officers and volunteers covered about 175 square miles while looking for Teresa. Everyone was determined to find her. Special Agent Vizi said, I don't believe that she would have just vanished off the face of the earth. In other words, Teresa was somewhere, they just had to find her. One of the most challenging aspects of Teresa's case was the area. The Lafayette terrain was easy to hide things in, but hard to search. Woods near Sam's home went for miles and miles. There was mountains, which were treacherous to climb. Plus, there was a thick carpet of knee-high plants covering the ground wherever you went. You could be standing right next to Teresa's prone body and not know it. Federal agents were also concerned about the hundreds of old wells literally in rural Lafayette and Walker County. The old wells would be a convenient spot to dump a body and let it decompose in the water. And investigators knew that since Sam grew up in the area, he'd have a good understanding of the nearby wells. He would know which ones were out in the open, and he'd know which ones were hidden. Investigators hit the ground running. They interviewed everyone in Teresa's life, friends, family, neighbors, and colleagues. Within seven days, the police had spoken with over 100 people. During those interviews, detectives learned that there were two distinctive narratives circulating around Sam and Teresa's relationship and Sam's alleged abuse. According to Teresa's family, Sam was a vicious drunk. And not only was he an angry drunk, but he was a jealous one. When Sam had one too many, he would start accusing Teresa of cheating on him. And then he'd start swinging. For years, Teresa's family begged her to leave Sam, but she refused. She loved Sam so much. According to her sister Christina, 
Teresa did not want to give up on the relationship. But every day, Teresa would call her family. She'd hop on the phone with her mom or her sisters, and every day, they would probably wonder if Sam was working on his temper. But he wasn't. Teresa didn't talk about Sam's anger and how bad the abuse was. She didn't report it to the police. Teresa's sister, Christina, told 48 Hours, I think she hit it very well, and I think she hit it from everybody. When Teresa finally decided to leave Sam in March of 2007, her family was relieved. Finally, she would be safe. The Chattanooga Times reported that Teresa's niece said she knew she was making the right decision. It was just a matter of getting away from him. She was so close. But Sam's family had a different impression of his drinking. His brother Kenneth said it wasn't a problem. Sam was a fun and happy drunk. And according to Sam's sister Carolyn, she had never seen Sam hurt anybody while drunk. Sam himself said that his drinking was blown way out of proportion. He liked to drink, but he didn't have a problem. It didn't affect his job or anything. Um, that's just called being a functioning alcoholic there, big guy. Sam's family also had a different perspective on his and Teresa's relationship. Sure, Sam and Teresa fought. And yes, they got loud. And maybe the two adults were a little toxic. But Sam wasn't abusive by any means. His brother, Kenneth, said that Sam and Teresa liked to play mind games. Kenneth attributed most of their fights to Teresa, not Sam. He told 48 Hours, quote, she knew exactly what button to push if she wanted to fight. And after all, Teresa had never filed any police charges against Sam. So she must have been safe, right? Wrong. Very, very wrong. Let's look at the facts. Sam's ex-wife said he was abusive. Teresa said he was abusive. On two separate occasions, the cops were called during Sam and Teresa's arguments. Both times, the officers could tell that Sam, not Teresa, was the aggressor. Teresa had told several of her friends and family members that she feared Sam. And we don't even need to include Sam's nonstop joking about killing Teresa and hiding her body where no one would find it. This was an abusive relationship. Sam was an abuser. And that's really all there is to it. Luckily, the investigators caught on to that pretty quickly. You know, it's one thing to defend your family over small things, but every family knows who the mean drunk is in the clan. And when a woman is dead, how could you still blame her? It's disgusting. On Friday, March 23rd, two days after anyone had laid eyes on Teresa, Sam called her sister, Christina. During this phone call, Christina thought that Sam sounded strange. He was talking very quickly and kept clearing his throat as if he had a cold. But maybe he was just anxious. After all, his wife was missing. And Sam did offer to help look for Teresa after he got off work the next morning. But when Christina asked Sam if he had seen Teresa recently, he said no, he couldn't have. Sam was out fishing with a buddy early Thursday morning. According to Sam, when he left the house at the crack of dawn, Christina's vehicle was where it always was, in the garage. But of course, we know this is a lie. Teresa's car wasn't in the garage when Sam said it was. Lafayette police officer Shane Green verified that at 6.30 a.m. on Thursday morning with other officers with him to witness it. Detectives also spotted this lie in Sam's story. On Sunday, March 25th, four days after Teresa went missing, the GBI questioned Sam Parker. At this point, he wasn't an official suspect. The special agents just wanted to understand Sam's timeline around the hours that Teresa went missing. But it was a huge red flag when Sam's timeline did not match the evidence. Sam told the police that the last time he saw Teresa was at 7.30 a.m. on Wednesday morning. Teresa was moving her things to her new apartment. Then, he claimed he was out of the house all Wednesday night through Thursday morning. First, he had had a date with a woman named Christy Bellflower. After that, he went fishing with his buddy in the morning. According to Sam, he hadn't been home at all, 
and he had been driving his pickup truck the entire time. So why did Officer Shane Green and Sam's neighbors say Sam's pickup truck was parked outside his home on Thursday morning? A special agent working the case told 48 Hours, I couldn't understand why he would lie about something that small. At least I thought it was small at the time. And then the agents caught Sam in yet another lie. He insisted he had not tried to contact Teresa since Wednesday, but Sam's phone records showed that he had called Teresa two times early on Thursday morning, the same morning she was discovered missing. The same morning Teresa's colleague Rhonda got that unusual phone call from Teresa. Sam was adamant that he hadn't made any calls to Teresa, and the GBI agents thought this was bizarre. It's standard operating procedure to check phone records, and Sam would know that. Sam seemed baffled that the GBI was so interested in him. He told 48 Hours, they're drawing conclusions that she may have been harmed and she may be possibly dead. Me personally, I'm not going to let that enter my mind until I have to. Sam explained to the authorities that Teresa was fine, and he shared with them his theory, that Teresa had run away to Mexico with a guy named Elvis. Yeah, you can't make this shit up. Not long before Teresa disappeared, she took a vacation to Mexico with her nieces. They stayed at a Cancun resort, and according to Sam, Teresa met a local man who worked as a resort entertainer. His name was Elvis. Sam said that Teresa and Elvis really hit it off. He was really selling this Elvis BS. But investigators had to pursue this lead and flew to Cancun. The special agents showed Teresa's photo to numerous Cancun resorts. Ultimately, they determined that this theory was unreasonable. Teresa and Elvis were not hiding away somewhere in Mexico. Shocker. Back in Lafayette, Special Agent James Harris reached Teresa's new apartment, which was clearly unoccupied. The home supply store, Lowe's, had tried to deliver Teresa her newly purchased washer and dryer, but no one was there to accept the order. The delivery people had left a flyer on her doorknob. Agent Harris found normal items in Teresa's apartment, clothes, shoes, and a work uniform. Nothing to indicate that she had left on a trip to Mexico, though, and nothing to indicate where she had gone. On the weekend of Saturday, March 31st, over a week after Teresa went missing, the GBI told the Chattanooga Times Free Press that Sam Parker was officially a person of interest. Local investigators and the GBI searched Sam's home. Over the course of this investigation, they had searched his home five times. Authorities didn't share with the public what they found in Sam's home, but they did confiscate Sam's collection of old guns and rifles. These searches upset Sam. According to him, the investigators didn't look through Teresa's stuff at his house. Sam told local reporters that he was being framed for Teresa's disappearance. He said, Everything I've ever said has been swept under the carpet and made me the bad guy. He was critical that the police dropped all other leads to focus on him. But according to the police, all leads kept taking them straight back to Sam. On the Monday following his house being searched, Sam continued to deny any involvement in Teresa's disappearance. The next day, on Tuesday, April 3rd, one of Sam's police co-workers named Ben Chafin was arrested. Apparently, Ben had made false statements related to Teresa's investigation, but the detectives never released what those statements were or how they affected Teresa's case. If you're confused as to who Ben Chafin is or how he was involved in all this, you're not alone. Everyone was confused back in April of 2007, too. Teresa's family thought Sam would be arrested, so they were surprised to see yet another Lafayette police officer was somehow involved. Ben was charged with violation of oath by a public officer, tampering with evidence, and computer invasion of privacy. None of Ben's involvement was ever explained, but the county sheriff assured the general public that the arrest indicated progress for Teresa's case. Meanwhile, Sam was fired from the Lafayette PD after 25 years of service. He'd never been allowed to return after his supervisors put him on leave for Teresa's investigation. 
When the Lafayette PD conducted their own internal investigation on Sam, they discovered he had explosives in his work locker. It's not clear what type of explosives Sam had or why they were in his locker, but if I had to guess, the Lafayette PD was looking to distance themselves from Sam. They could see the writing on the wall, and the explosives thing was probably an easy way to do it. It could have just been firecrackers for all we know. Teresa's investigation and the search for her body continued for months, until finally, detectives found something promising in Teresa's Toyota 4Runner. Remember, the one that went missing on Thursday morning, only to mysteriously appear in Sam's garage on Thursday afternoon. Investigators noticed that someone had cleaned the SUV. There were visible vacuum marks on the carpet in the back of the vehicle and a rubber floor mat that was usually in the trunk area was missing. And this is where detectives made perhaps their most important discovery. Teresa's blood was on the SUV's bumper, and Sam's DNA was in the same location. Although it took a long time to definitively identify these samples as Teresa's blood and Sam's DNA, once they had the verification, well, this was their smoking gun. Finally, the police had enough evidence to arrest Sam Parker. Before the Georgia Bureau of Investigation arrested Sam, they consulted with an FBI Behavioral Analysis Unit professional. They were uneasy about Sam's history of violence and experience as a law enforcement officer. How would he react to being arrested for a murder he maintains he didn't commit? The last thing they wanted was a standoff. The FBI behavioral analysis expert instructed the GBI agents to approach Sam in a very low-key manner. No SWAT team, no sirens. They didn't want Sam to kick into his fight-or-flight mode because he probably would choose to fight. So on the morning of Monday, February 4th, 2008, almost a year after Teresa's disappearance, two GBI agents knocked on Sam's door. Sam knew the agents well. After all, they had searched his house five times by this point. He opened the door and was arrested for Teresa's murder on his front porch. He went without a fight, only asking Agent Veazey to turn off his coffee pot. The next day, Sam was indicted for malice murder, false statements, computer invasion of privacy, and violation of oath by a public officer. He was held without bond. Teresa's body was still missing. Naturally, probably confident she wouldn't be found, Sam still maintained his innocence. And his family believed him. Around this time, Sam's sister Carolyn released a statement saying that Sam had nothing to do with harming Teresa. Sam's brother Kenneth told reporters that he still thought Teresa had run off to Mexico, or maybe California. He felt that the police had targeted Sam out of desperation. Kenneth reasoned that Sam had already been divorced twice, so why would he murder his soon-to-be ex-wife now? But Teresa's family disagreed with Kenneth and Carolyn. Fox News reported that Teresa's sister Christina said the following, I can honestly say that I do believe he is involved. That's what I feel, that's what I know in my heart. I know of an incident last year where she was really scared, she was really afraid, and she looked me in the eyes and told me she was afraid that she was going to die. Sam's arrest was bittersweet for Teresa's family. They were glad that there was forward momentum for Teresa's case, but Sam was like family to them, so it really hurt. For over a decade, he had been Teresa's husband. They had gone to family members' birthday parties together, bought each other Christmas gifts. If Sam killed Teresa, his crime didn't just impact Teresa's life, He had betrayed her entire family, too. The GBI knew from the get-go that Teresa's case would go to trial. Nobody cases always do, and Teresa's body was nowhere to be found. It's really difficult to convict a murderer without a body because the prosecution has to win two arguments. Number one, that Teresa was a victim of a crime, and number two, that Sam perpetuated that crime. Long story short, it didn't benefit Sam to plead guilty. At this time, the state of Georgia 
had only ever convicted a handful of killers without the victim's body, so the odds were in Sam's favor. Sam's trial began on Monday, August 17, 2009. It was held in the Walker County Superior Court. The jury consisted of six men and six women. Sam would be represented by the public defender, David Dunn. DA Lee Patterson painted a picture of Sam as an obsessive, wife-beating asshole. He was controlling, he was manipulative, and it was completely possible that he killed Teresa. This was the prosecution's interpretation of that fateful night. After Teresa left her sister's house on Wednesday evening, she went to her new apartment. Teresa left a little after midnight, drove to Sam's house, and went inside. Teresa thought Sam would be fast asleep, but he wasn't. He was waiting for her. Between 12.30 and 1.30 a.m. on March 22nd of 2007, Sam murdered Teresa. Then he put her body in the back of her own SUV. And then he went to work, establishing his alibi. He drove to his friend Christy Bellflower's house for a booty call. They called it a date in the court documents, but it was 2 a.m. This wasn't a date. In court, Christy testified that Sam was indeed at her house in the late night and early morning. Sam brought his signature water bottle of vodka, and he left around 5 a.m. Sometime between 5.30 a.m. and 7.30 a.m., Sam took Teresa's SUV, dumped her body, and returned her SUV back to his garage. The prosecution brought witnesses who testified to Sam's animosity towards Teresa. One of Teresa's nieces said that any time she would turn her back, he would flip her off and cuss behind her back. Sam's second wife, Keila Beard, testified to Sam's abuse and his continuous reminders that he would kill her and hide her body. And then Ben Chafin testified, the mysterious police officer who was arrested in relation to Teresa's case. Ben told the court that he and Sam were so close that they were like brothers. So Ben knew that Teresa and Sam were on the rocks, and on the night Teresa vanished, Sam called Ben at 4 a.m. Ben explained he said something that he'd really done it this time or he's really going to do it this time. He said that he had a place that was going to be hard to find her. They would never find her, and that he had shot Teresa through the head. Then Sam hung up. But he called back only a few minutes later. During this second phone call, Sam told Ben to keep quiet. If Ben told anyone about this conversation, Sam would kill him. This seems groundbreaking for the prosecution, but Ben's testimony didn't actually have much weight. In fact, jurors later confirmed that they ignored every word that came out of Ben's mouth. First of all, where was Ben a year ago when Teresa went missing? When Sam's attorney asked Ben why he didn't say all this sooner, Ben said he forgot. And apparently, Ben had given the authorities five different stories about that night, and he had been arrested for hacking Teresa's computer, although it was never explained how, when, or why he did that. And the jurors also thought Ben might be trying to get out of a jam. He had received full immunity for testifying on behalf of the prosecution. He could have said anything. Sam's defense attorney said Ben was the most unbelievable witness I had seen in 26 years of practicing law. Luckily, the DA, Lee Patterson, had a few other cards up her sleeves. When the search for Teresa began, Sam had bruises on his arm. They were in the shape of fingertips. She argued that these bruises were when he held Teresa in a chokehold. She would have pressed hard on his arm while fighting back. This is how the state believed Sam murdered Teresa. The prosecution did a dramatic in-court demonstration of the chokehold. A male GBI special agent put his arm around Lee Patterson's neck, miming the attack. At this, there was an audible gasp in the courtroom. Onlookers were shocked that the female attorney's hands were placed in the exact location where Sam's bruises were. Sam's defense attorney called this argument an absolute fabrication. He said Sam's bruises were insignificant. 
The prosecution also explained how Stamp had gone to the hospital a few days after Teresa went missing. He had scratches on his legs and had dislocated his artificial hip. The prosecution argued that Sam hurt himself while fighting Teresa and moving her body. But Sam said he sustained those injuries in the woods while looking for his dead wife. Which is an odd way to describe your wife, who you said ran away to Mexico with Elvis. Unless you knew she hadn't run away at all. And then there was Teresa's blood in the back of her SUV. Investigators had only found a few drops which was probably because someone had clearly cleaned the SUV before the police got their hands on it. But Sam's attorney said that Teresa had dropped a snow globe while she was moving out. The glass broke and cut her, thus leaving the blood droplets. They also suggested that maybe the blood was from a long time ago. There really was no way to tell. Additionally, the prosecution revealed that Sam had something disturbing in his old police locker. And I'm not talking about the explosives. Sam had a poster of a woman who was badly bruised with a crude caption underneath. The court documents didn't say what the caption said, but it sounds like it was a bad joke about domestic violence. I'm going to make a guess that it's that old I had to tell her twice joke. Disgusting. Sam's defense tried to blow it off. Sam put the poster in his locker instead of the trash. He didn't mean anything misogynistic by it. The prosecuting attorney responded by saying, he was the guy who thought this was funny. Ladies and gentlemen, Teresa Parker almost made it out. She almost made it to her new life. Find him accountable. Find him guilty. The defense's entire case centered on the fact that the prosecution had only circumstantial evidence. They said this was trial by character assassination. Sam's defense attorney told 48 Hours, murder is a messy business. It's virtually impossible to do this kind of thing and leave no traces, no indications, no evidence. Well, maybe not if you're a police officer and you know what you're doing. He and Sam also claimed that Teresa was cheating on Sam, that she might have been seeing someone else, which isn't the greatest defense. It's just more motive. A week before 41-year-old Teresa Parker disappeared, she took a three-day vacation to Gatlinburg, Tennessee. She stayed in a cozy cabin in the Smoky Mountains called the Honey Bee Hideaway. Sam knew of his soon-to-be ex-wife's trip. He had even given her some money for shopping, probably trying to butter her up. Teresa's sister Christina also knew of the trip. Christina later said, she called me her first morning there and was like, I'm having coffee outside. It's just beautiful. Teresa said she wanted to get away to clear her mind. She just wanted to de-stress for a weekend, alone. Or at least that's what she told everyone. Despite pretending to be okay with the trip, Sam wasn't. He was suspicious that Teresa was cheating on him. So Sam did what his defense lawyers described as investigating. Others might describe it as stalking. Either way, Sam contacted the cabin's owners. He found out that Teresa had booked the cabin under a fake name. She registered under Barker, not Parker with a B. And the cabin was booked for two people, not one. But Sam clearly knew where to call, so it doesn't sound that secretive. Why would she use a fake name? And who went with Teresa to this cabin? Well, Sam suspected that it was his fellow police officer and Teresa's friend, Shane Green. You might remember Shane's name. He was the one who checked out Sam's house the morning that Teresa went missing, peeking in the garage windows. In court, it was confirmed that Teresa had invited Shane to the cabin that weekend, but Shane said he didn't go, and his cell phone activity placed him far away from the Honey Bee hideaway that weekend. But Sam's brother, Kenneth, asserted that Shane and Teresa were definitely romantically involved. Shane said that was blatantly false. And come on, perhaps Teresa's cabin wasn't as illicit as it sounds. Maybe the cabin administrator misheard Parker for Barker. Maybe you could only get the king bed if you booked for two people. Like I said, Sam knew who the owners were. 
And it's not like Teresa didn't have cause to need a small vacation to clear her mind. She was ending a 13-year marriage. She was a thoughtful woman who didn't make capricious decisions. Honestly, it doesn't really matter. Even if Teresa was cheating on Sam, her secretly abusive husband, she didn't deserve to die for it. Sam's defense wanted to establish that Teresa was cheating so they could say she was still alive, frolicking somewhere with a new man. But do you really think a woman like Teresa, who was so close to her family, would run off with a man and not contact them for over two years? Not to mention she had a career she loved. And I must say here, when you are planning on leaving your husband, it's not really cheating. It's not like she could be open about her plans to this man with such a violent, hair trigger temper. At trial, since Teresa's body was missing, the prosecution was forced to spend a lot of time explaining that Teresa was dead. They showed the jurors that Teresa's bank accounts and phone records had been dormant since her disappearance. That month, in August of 2009, a QVC package addressed to Teresa arrived at her old home with Sam, but it was widely accepted that QVC just made some sort of error and sent Teresa a package two and a half years late. Still, Sam's defense persisted. His attorney said, nobody knows that she was killed. There's no physical evidence. There's no forensic evidence. There's nothing to show that she was killed. All in all, the trial lasted two weeks. The prosecution presented 71 witnesses and 200 pieces of evidence. The defense had six witnesses. Sam did not take the stand in his own defense. After three days of deliberating, the jury was almost deadlocked. If they couldn't come to a decision, there would have been a retrial. The split was eight to four. The judge spoke with the jury and urged them to make a decision using a court procedure called an Allen charge. In 1896, in Allen v. the United States, the Supreme Court ruled of approving the use of a jury instruction intended to prevent a hung jury by encouraging jurors in the minority to reconsider. So, the jurors took another look at Sam's cell phone records. They indicated that Sam was lying about his location during the hours when Teresa went missing. And so, on Thursday, December 3rd, 2009, after four days of deliberation and two and a half years after Teresa went missing, Sam Parker was found guilty of murdering Teresa. He was also found guilty of making false statements and violating his oath as a public officer. He was acquitted of the charge of computer invasion of privacy. Sam was sentenced to life in prison, plus five years for the non-murder charges. Teresa's family, watching in the courtroom, cried in relief. To this day, Sam maintains he never hurt Teresa. After he was convicted, he spoke with 48 Hours about Teresa's case. He said, I never caused her, you know, bad times or, you know, never once hurt her. But Teresa's family knew that her killer had been locked away. All they wanted now was to find her body. Teresa's sister, Christina, said, you want to find her, bring her home, lay her to rest. That's what she deserves, you know. She's not a piece of trash, and that's how I feel he treated her. Wherever she is out there, she doesn't deserve to be there. Convicting Teresa's murderer meant a lot to a lot of people. The town of Lafayette, as well as the police force and 911 center, where Teresa was a much beloved colleague. The GBI, who had worked so hard to solve her case, and the DA's office were also very much relieved. DA Lee Patterson, who came from Floyd County to try the case, said she had missed her home, family, and church for the two months the investigation and trial took for her, but she found encouragement at the nearby Chickamauga Baptist Church. It's just another testament to the wonderful community in and around the small town of Lafayette and Walker County that extends into Chickamauga and into Tennessee, with Chattanooga being so close. And I love that it was a female DA to put Sam's misogynistic ass away.
Sam Parker immediately requested a new trial but was denied. He appealed that decision, and on November 17, 2014, the Supreme Court of Georgia denied him. It was a unanimous decision, and it was heavily influenced by one very important development. They had found Teresa's body. Three and a half years after Teresa disappeared, on Monday, September 20, 2010, two farmers were working their cornfield near the Chattooga River in Chattooga County, Georgia. There had been floods recently, so they were clearing out the driftwood, and one of the farmers bumped his foot against something strange, not driftwood, but a human jawbone. It would be identified as Teresa Parker's jawbone. For two days, authorities recovered as much of Teresa's skeleton as they could find. GBI forensic technicians used dental records to verify the remains as Teresa's. Medical experts said Teresa was a victim of homicide, but they couldn't determine Teresa's cause of death. They found a hole in her skull, but experts determined it wasn't from a bullet, but they couldn't figure out much else. The body had been out in the woods for far too long. Still, finding Teresa's body was a miracle. This farmer literally stumbled over her. Although Sam never confessed to murdering Teresa, the jurors from Teresa's case felt in their hearts that they had made the right decision. Now they knew for sure. Because Teresa's bones were found 12 miles from Sam's father's house. Sam had been staying at his dad's place a lot as he and Teresa went through their divorce. And Sam's cell phone data showed him moving in that exact direction the night that Teresa vanished. Teresa's family was relieved that she had been found, but they were still upset. A law enforcement officer on the case said it best. It's a great day, and it's a terrible day. It's great we have answers. Unfortunately, it's not the answers we wanted. You know, even in cases like this, families can't help but hang on to shreds of hope. D.A. Lee Patterson told the Northwest Georgia News, It justified what we did. She didn't have any enemies. We only had one person with a motive, Sam Parker. It validated everything. It was the hardest case I ever tried in my life. Sam continued to deny everything. He said he was nowhere near where the police and his cell phone records indicated he was. In an interview with the Chattanooga Times Free Press, Sam said, They had to paint me to look like a horrible person so the jury would hate me, and that's what they did. They destroyed my character in front of 12 people that don't know me. Well, then why didn't you get up there and testify in your own defense, Sam? Now, Sam Parker is serving his life sentence in Long State Prison in southern Georgia. He's told reporters that he knows who Teresa's real killer is, but he wouldn't share any names. I love these kind of killers, as if you would hold on to the real killer's name. And Sam swears that even if he was executed, he'd maintain that he never harmed Teresa. It's just more hyperbole from a man who seemed to have planned carefully when he killed his soon-to-be ex-wife, if you ask me. A man who had the bad taste to have a joke photo about domestic violence hanging in his police locker for crying out loud. A man who had the offensive manners to joke often about hiding her body when he killed her. A man who one day proved he wasn't joking when it literally took years to find her body. But this case is still a powerful reminder of the kindness of people, despite Sam's despicable act. Teresa's family was surrounded by a community that rallied around them, not just the police and GBI, but everyone. Their love, prayers, and hard work also turned into donations when a fund was later set up in Teresa's name to help fight domestic violence. Southern Fried True Crime is hosted and produced by me, Erica Kelly. 
Today's episode was researched and written by Andrea Marshbank. And of course, all editorial opinions are my own. Southern Fraud's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. Today's episode was edited and mixed by Brandon Shack Snyder of Southern Gothic and Erica Kelly. If you have any case suggestions, please go to my website and click on the listener suggestion tab or email sftcresearch at gmail.com. You'll get lost in a sea of emails if you send it to my main address. So this is the best way for me to get those little-known cases y'all always send me. Please remember that I do not accept suggestions on social media, private messages. With three platforms to manage, that is very overwhelming for me. I hope you understand. But please come join our Facebook group, Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group, where we swap recipes, worship Dolly Parton, and share memes. I much prefer spending my social media time in our lovely group. We do, of course, discuss true crime, not just Southern fraud, but all kinds, but it is still very much a Southern lifestyle group. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say, no shit ass is allowed. It's not just a motto, it's how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe, and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on all large platforms like iHeart, Stitcher, Spotify, and now Amazon and Audible. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.